We'll have more join us as we go. I laugh at the fact that we put a start time on these classes. Um, the other day I was in Oklahoma at this little congregation and I showed up 15 minutes early and walked in and the whole Bible class was there. They all had their Bibles out and all that and I said, I never knew Oklahoma was the mission field because that's, that's the way people act in other places. Here at sunset I get made fun of because in our class when it's time to start, I start standing at the front and they say, oh wait, this is still visitation time. Oh wait, this is time where everybody's getting their coffee. Oh wait, this is all this. And I go, well this 45 minute lesson is going to be a tough 10 minute talk. But I'm just glad they let me teach. That's awesome. Before we get started, I want to sort of go back over the list of things we talked about yesterday. Um, we talked about the situation in our country. I don't want to be bleak, but if you travel around and speak at different congregations, it impacts you. It affects you how hopeless people feel, how desperate people are for change and growth, how frustrated we get, and it makes us say things that aren't true. A lady yesterday came to me after the talk and said, Church has never been as sad and depleted as today. And I said, the one thing I've learned in church work is everything is pretty secular. And things do come and go. And I said, but now one thing I do believe, and if we don't change it, it's going to be really be impacting is our preachers and our church leaders are a little less Bible literate maybe than before. And maybe we need more education for them. And we focused here on preachers for a long time. But my favorite classmate was named Bruce Billings. Do you remember Bruce and Eleanor Billings? Uh, Eleanor's here uh, at the workshop. Um, Bruce, they asked him to be an elder and it scared him to death. And he said, shouldn't you know a lot to be the feeder of the flock? Shouldn't you have a lot of preparation for that? He goes, I'll accept the challenge in two years. And he came in his advanced age to be a student here at Sunset. And I thought that was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. But the truth is, congregations can't really afford for all their leaders to come to Sunset for two years. So we want to talk about how we can help them. But first, I just want to repeat for those who weren't here, and even just to remind those of us that are here, this SALT program is part of a really much bigger deal called Mission America. This morning during the flag presentation, I reached out and touched the Ukrainian flag as it passed by. That was my home. That was our mission field. And I got to tell you, when we got off the plane at the airport in Kiev, Ukraine, I was looking for someone to study the Bible with. The whole time we were there, we were on point looking for who we were going to study the Bible with. We planted churches. We did so many great things. And then I came back to the United States and I relaxed a little. Maybe we've all relaxed too much. Because now we see a nation in crisis. But we also see our congregations feeling like they're in a state of crisis. Now I'm not a doom and gloom guy. Because I believe in the power of God in his church. I believe that Jesus is the planter and builder of the church. I believe the Holy Spirit works within the church. That's what I learned here. I learned it from Nat and Ed and others who taught here. And I have great belief that there will always be Christians that stand up and are counted. But the numbers getting fewer and the numbers getting older has got to worry us even inside the Lord's church. Twelve keys to Mission America. One was preacher and ministry training. We've been doing it for over 50 years, but if we don't do it better with more people, we're going to be in trouble. We need to have this whole room filled up with people that want to be preachers. Because we have too many congregations. They call all the time saying, we're in Connecticut, we're in West Virginia, we're in Indiana, we're in all these different states, and there are no preachers for us to have here. We put our ad in the paper in the Christian Chronicle and all that. No one responds. Nobody's moving here. We've got to take people from those places, train them, and send them home. We need more domestic mission teams and church planters. There are way too many communities that have no lighthouse. There are way too many places that once had a great congregation. 
We got to prepare new people, younger people, to go to those places. We got to have more leadership training. We'll talk about that in depth. We have to have more Hispanic church planting and church growth. Our nation has changed. My hometown has changed. The phone book has changed. The restaurants have changed. I don't know about where you grew up, but in Dumas, Texas, everything's different. When I go watch my nephew play sports, he's playing with guys with all Hispanic names. And yet our congregations through our area are way too Anglo. We don't include enough Hispanics. We don't have nearly enough Iglesia de Cristos for people to depend on. Luis Melendez has moved here with his family. They're in the back. Others, Arthur Puente has been a church planter and, and a teacher. We need to start mobilizing this because it's where Sunset had its start but it's where our nation is now. Maybe Klein was prophetic in saying we need a Spanish-speaking preaching school to train preachers in, that speak Spanish. Maybe he was just 50 years too early. I don't think so. But we definitely need it now. And if Sunset can't answer that call, we've forgotten our heritage. We need more humanitarian outreach and community assistance. I don't believe our job in this life is simply to feed and care for others. Our job is to teach the gospel of Christ. But if we do not feed and care for others, we will have no audience for teaching the gospel. And we've got to get out of this. It's got to be one or the other and get down to what's true. In San Antonio, working in a mission area at the Alamo City Church of Christ, you guys there working that mission, if you didn't help anyone, you wouldn't have much. You've got to serve. You've got to minister. And we need to work with those who help us do that well. We've got to give, Sunset's going to be giving free materials and resources. First of all, a lot of these starving congregations can't afford the stuff we offer. Isn't that sad? So we're just going to have to start giving it all away. The good thing is, I have learned through the Solar Player Project, we can't outgive the Lord's Church in the United States. We can't give away more stuff than people here will provide for. And I thank God for that. And if you want to know a bright ray of sunshine, our congregations are so generous. Sending missionaries all over. Don't you feel that way, Danny? So generous. We just have to be thankful for what we receive. Next thing is the Arabic mission outreach to Muslims. Saw another program last night, turned it on. What are we going to do with Muslims in America? We are going to teach them the gospel of Christ and make them part of the New Testament church. Just like we do with every religion, everywhere, from every people group in the world. I, I know that extremists are, are, fear, are causing fear. But extremism has always caused fear. But it's never been stronger than the power of God to save, as Ed reminded us of this morning. Tonight at our banquet, Wassam Alathewi will be teaching, talking about the real things that can be done. That'll be so exciting. We're talking about campus ministry. Texas A&M Commerce. Still hurts my tongue to go through that A&M part. Texas A&M Commerce. An AIM team is going to descend with a graduate of Sunset on that campus and turn it inside out. Isaac and Jennifer McNally, this AIM team are going to do great things. We've got a lot of college campuses we need to have great works like that on every one because that is the age where most people come to a knowledge of Christ. Future Preachers Camp. I decided to be a preacher when I was a little boy. Most preachers did. Too many today are coming to it late in life because they'll say, I never even knew that was an option for me. Right, Trent? They didn't even know that was possible. I knew it was possible had an elder named Jimmy Clark in the congregation I grew up in. When I was a little boy, they put a big milk crate, and I stood on the milk crate, and I gave my, my sermon with everything I had in me. Most popular sermon I've ever given. It was like three and a half minutes. <laughs> and at the end, he came and said, Chris, if you want to be a gospel preacher, we'll send you to Sunset. Ed had been there the week before, and I got up and talked about the nature of the New Testament church. I didn't steal any of that. I made it all up myself, Ed. Now, I, I was parroting what I'd heard. But I knew from that moment on, I was going to go where he was. 
I was going to study from guys like this. We need to let kids know they can be preachers. Sizemore boys need to know you can be preachers. You can start early, go all your life. And we need to have a camp that helps them realize that dream. Tenth, we need to really work with our military outreach and education. I called an Air Force base and said, told them who I was, told them that I had worked as an Army chaplain in the National Guard and all that. What do I have to go through? And they said, come talk to us. We'll let you in. We need character. We need good teaching. There will be some limits. We'll have to explain all that to you, but we'll let you do this. We offer benefits. We take benefits from the military, the VA benefits, so that people can study here and the government pay for their studies. That's so awesome. But we need to start ministering before they get to that point if we hope to grow that group. And our job is not just in the streets of our hometown. It's also in the streets of our military bases. We need to minister in any way that we can. Ministries like the Amen Ministries, y'all ever hear that? Ah, oh, they've been doing it forever, haven't they? We're going to join them. We're going to ask them how to do it. Um, that's going to be important. Then there's influencing national leaders. I'm working on a trip to Washington. I'm going to take my dad with me, uh, Washington, D.C. I've talked to congressmen and senators who have said, if you come, we'll meet and we'll discuss the need for biblical character in Washington, D.C. Now, there will be a lot of people not meet with us. That's always been the case, hadn't it? It's not a discouragement. But there are a number of them who come from, some of them from different religions. They want to meet and talk about how to return us to our center that's so important to us. I'm going to be looking and putting together a team of people that will go for that meeting. I'm going to let my dad sort of lead the way in some of it. He was a representative here in Texas for my children's lifetime. And he talks the talk. He knows how to go through the things. But I asked them, What's the limit on what I can talk about? And they said, if you talk about the Bible, nobody can stop you. Well, that happens to be what we can do really well. <laughs> but instead of going on Facebook and complaining about your national leaders, why don't we instead try to be proactive and do something to help? We whined long enough. Somebody after the lesson yesterday said, well, you know, people like Donald Trump would never, ever listen. And real quick, I just want to share with you a very short story. I was at a Brotherhood event speaking along with another man. His name was Phil Robertson. He's the duck commander. He is an amazing, uh, very different kind of guy. His son, Alan, has a, a degree from Sunset. Um, he went to White's Ferry Road, went through us to get his degree uh, these guys all went to the White's Ferry Road School of Preaching. They all preach. They all teach. They tried to bring that through on their show as much as the rules would allow and even sort of beyond the rules. But Donald Trump called Phil Robertson and said, I've got a problem. I'm not popular with a lot of conservatives in Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, Mississippi. I need somebody to stand right there with me, stand on the side with me, and stand there and let them know that people like you are with me. And Phil said, what do you mean, people like me? Well, camo-wearing, redneck, gun-toting, all that. And I still remember that speech because I said, well, look, Duck Commander's up there. This has got to be pretty good. Phil said, I'll meet with you. And Donald Trump's office said that we can give you 30 minutes. And we want to talk about how you can help the campaign. And Phil said, I'm not going to talk about that. If I get 30 minutes, we're going to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he sat down with him and he showed us the paper where he drew the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he had little pictures of stick figure Donald Trump dying, being buried, and being resurrected. <laughs> and he was talking about this stuff and he said, I want you to come to Louisiana. I want you to come out to my place. I want you to strip down to nothing. We'll get in the water and I'll baptize you into Christ Jesus. And he said, I just can't do that right now. And he said, then I will be after you until you do. We ought to be praying that the duck commander still has the ear. He loves the idea of the Bible. He needs to love God's word. 
He loves the idea of God leading our nation. He needs to come to really understand what that is. And instead of throwing rocks, let's pray that that's what happens. Because the duck commander has got another appointment. And I'm praying that this really happens. Because if you don't believe lives can change, don't even read the book of Daniel about what Daniel does with Nebuchadnezzar. Because it's just going to shock you. Because God is over all the nations. But God's prophets impact those thrones. And that's still, I think, true today. Well, I want to talk about salt. I know you know a lot about salt. Salt makes things taste good. Not too long ago, a doctor told me you need to use less salt, and I said, I need less doctors. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be giving all that up. I have found salt substitute. That's just an insult to Bible theology. <laughs> no salt substitutes allowed. But it does give flavor to things, just as the Lord's church gives a beautiful flavor to communities. Salt's of great value. Did you know that the first true currency was salt? It was used by the Holy Roman Empire. They would meet in solariums, places of salt. And there they would measure out to the officers salt that they would in turn take to their soldiers as their pay because it was the most valuable thing in the marketplace and they could go trade salt for whatever they needed. Salt has always had incredible value. And when Jesus said salt is of great value, he meant literally. It's the most precious commodity we have. And we have to learn to appreciate that. But salt that Jesus talks about is of the same value today as it was 2,000 years ago. Salt's a preservative. Our forefathers rolled their ham in salt. Get that water out so that your meat wouldn't decay. If we got a decaying world, the answer isn't more water. The answer is more salt. And we got to be willing to put that in. Salt is healing. Salt was one of the first medicines that we have. The Egyptians used it to kill infection. Years and years and years before anyone else was dealing with infection. Salt creates thirst. My dad is here. There was something he did to me that was horrible. Most things he did was really great. We would get these trucks of salt blocks and I would have to unload those. I have bent toes from the times they landed on my toes. Um, but people would sit these out with their cattle. They'd lick that salt. They just couldn't get enough of that salt. Then they'd drink their water and they'd eat and they would grow like they wouldn't have grown before. The salt that Jesus talks about is a salt that's going to create a thirst for righteousness in us that we desperately need. And we're not supposed to just purvey the salt. It's us. Salt is a part of covenant. I wish that Gerald Payton could stand here and talk about salt and covenant. I miss him so much. Don't you miss him? I miss everything that he says. He he taught us Levitical system, and he would talk about that priest there in the last second throwing that salt in the fire on top of the meat. And a lot of people think it's because he was doing a favor for the priest. But throughout time, when they would cut covenant, they would throw the salt in there to symbolize God's presence with us. And that's what the Lord's church is. It's God's presence among us. It is him living in a community, him living in a nation, him living in a state, him living in an area, him living inside this world. And we've got to appreciate more and more the salt that we are to be. Matthew 5.13 says, you're the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I hope it's not true that we're losing our saltiness. I fear that it, at least to some degree, is true. Well, then it's time to be salty again. Salt is good, Mark says. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Then he says something interesting. You'll have to have salt in yourselves. Did you know that we talk about the salt of the earth? We talk about that. But the number one topic of salt passages is... You can lose your saltiness. And we are warned, don't lose it. Don't lose your differentness from your culture. 
Don't lose your godness in an ungodless world. And we should thank God for the darkness because it makes light shine. We should thank God for the dry, dirt-like nature of the world around us because it makes the salt so precious. But we're going to have to focus on becoming more salty, more like Jesus in this world. If we're to become more salty, it's going to have to start with our leaders. Patrick Henry in the 1700s said, Kings come, kings go. The power of the pulpit remains. I think that's still true. I think the voice that goes from the front of that church building is still powerful. Still moves and changes people. And I don't like to see it denigrated. But there are a group of people that congregations choose from among themselves because they want to follow them. It's a gift of God in congregations. Elders and deacons. And I don't want to hold preachers up so high that we forget that the people chosen to follow are those local leaders. It's sort of like when you become, though, when you become a parent. When David Allen was born, I was not an expert on child care. I didn't really have much knowledge at all about kids and how to raise them. My wife, who had been trained as a school teacher, had much more, but even she would sit there and go, I don't know. So we'd start calling our moms. Uh, this is the sound the baby's making. What do we do? Mom would say, uh, is the baby wet? Is the baby hungry? Uh, no? Well, then you just bounce around for a while. So we'd be out there bouncing around going, this is parenthood. We got this now. I was in Artesia, New Mexico at a congregation. We were talking about bringing in new elders and all that. And finally, one of the elders said, before we bring in someone new, don't you think we ought to know what we're doing? And I looked at him with shock in my eyes, and then I went, this may become the greatest leader the church in this area has ever had. Because that is exactly the right question to ask. If we're going to be leading people, shouldn't we know what we're doing? Shouldn't we have that? And just like Bruce Billings coming from the Northeast years ago and coming here to study, he wants to know, but he can't leave the church because the church actually needs him there. It's important. I think we've got to think about how to help elders and deacons and preachers and ministers and education ministers and all of them. We've got to figure out a way to help them stay there and still be the kind of leaders that God needs. Four areas of emphasis with salt. It's going to sound great on the recording. Seminars and workshops, annual training events, leadership consulting and mentoring, tools for leaders. put together a long series and I've got a long list and my list keeps growing of things that we're going to talk about and we're going to go around and offer certification for leaders. The certification will come from Sunset, it's approved by the state of Texas, all those different things but the main reason for certification is make sure you go through the whole process. You go through the whole program and you get that. You can take that certification to Walmart and they won't take it back and they won't give you ten dollars. But it'll show that you completed that area of study. You can be certified in three different areas and there's some single intensive workshops. The first one is there will be ten seminars towards a certificate of excellence and leadership like becoming a visionary leader, becoming a conflict resolutionary leader, dealing with the problems you have or charting a path for the days ahead. I remember when I was in Portales the elders got together and they said Okay, we want to spend one time reviewing the last 10 years. We want to spend the time dealing with what we are today, and we want to spend time dealing with what happens in 10 years. We were so good at the first one. We were excellent. We could rehash that for days. Then we got to where we were, and we all looked around at each other and said, okay, you know what's coming. So where are we going to be in 10 years? And the answer everybody had was, we'll be sort of like we are now, but hopefully better. With goals like that, you're not going to get anywhere. You got to learn to do those things, and that's the kind of things we'll talk about. I was blessed to go back to Lubbock Christian and get my master's degree in leadership, and the first thing they said, 
is if you don't have a good view for the future, you're destined not to stay the same as you are today, but you're destined to decline rapidly. We've got to start having a good vision. Then there will be 10 seminars offered towards a certificate in congregational leadership, or a CCL. Examples is leading an evangelistic congregation, leading a leader developing congregation, worrying about taking young people and having them become your next generation of leaders. I was in a congregation a few weeks ago talking about how to have an evangelistic congregation. And at the end, one of the elders came up and said, you forgot to tell us this was going to be a lot of hard work. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was implied when you asked me. And he said, we were sort of hoping there would be a seminar or something you could do and everyone would come and join. We didn't know it was going to be like this. There's a lot of work in this. And I said, well, now you know the job, you got to determine if you want to do what you said you were going to do. Because it is hard. And we do need guidance and we do need help. This is where Ed's going to be really happy. We'll offer 10 seminars in Bible text on leadership towards a certificate in biblical leadership. Examples of studying Ephesians on equipping and empowering members to develop leaders. Or studies in Nehemiah on preparing for projects and programs where we are going to go through and we're going to find that those outcomes come from that, but we're just going to deal with the text. Because being biblically literate and having biblical character is a major foundation for a strong leadership and a strong congregation. It's just as important as when Nat was taking it to Russia and teaching those character points and those texts over there to teachers, so we need to do in our congregations. And I got to... <laughs> This is, I'm not going to tell you where this is from because this isn't a very positive thing. But I was with a group. They wanted me to come in and evaluate their youth minister because their kids weren't doing well. So, Jared, here's the way it goes. They said, we want you to develop a Bible test, give it to all the kids, determine their biblical knowledge and whether they're being biblically fed. And if they're not being fed well enough, we'll fire the youth minister and hire someone else. So I said, okay. First thing is, all the leaders take the test. And one of the elders said, we're not putting up with this. We're not taking the test. We want to know what our young people are getting from their youth minister. The preacher in the room is going, hey, wait, wait, wait. Let's not crawl into my area. Elders begin to shuffle papers around. And I said, you know, it's funny, our expectations for our kids. And I do believe we should have expectations, and I do believe that their teaching is of primary importance, and they need to be taught. But I'll tell you this. A lot of our children could walk in any congregation in the brotherhood and spellbound, it may leave them spellbound with their biblical knowledge. They've been going through a long system of learning God's word. Then we become adults, and we get whatever somebody wants to teach that time at that in that particular way and we begin to take it much less seriously because we've left the time of being students. Elders need to resharpen their swords on the Word of God. These offerings will grow with time. I'm out finding instructors, talking to different people. I talked to a guy the other day. He said, well, I don't know if I have any expertise. Well, I did plant 11 churches across Wisconsin and across our area, but I really don't know that I have anything special to offer. And I was going, wait, wait, go back. You did what? You planted 11 churches? Have I got a place for you? But we need to have those things. And I want you to be thinking about people who can teach things like that. Then there's a lot of individual workshops. These are the ones I'm doing right now. Practical evangelism, practical church planning, practical preaching, practical Bible class teaching, practical evidences, practical giving, practical missions, leaders renewal, small church growth, young preachers workshop. These are things I'm going around and teaching right now, and i got to tell you, there's no way in the world I'm ever going to keep up with the demand. It's going to have to be a lot of people that want to go out and teach classes like this. And I, teaching the church planting workshop just makes me so happy. I love it. That's what I teach here at the school. But some of these things are amazing. We were going through evidences, and you could see people all around the room going, oh, Boy, my faith is getting really tough right now. Things they had never thought about. We've got to have it. 
we're we'll looking for quality instructors and places to do this. There's also going to be annual training seminars. And what we're doing is, is we're going to go to each area of the country as much as we can and have things locally because not everybody can fly to Dallas, Fort Worth and fly to Lubbock and be here for that. So we're going to take it on the road and they're going to move around every year. And every two or three years, we're going to have one in Alaska and Hawaii. Don't everyone volunteer just for those because there's a lot of good states in between. Brother Larry here may give me the opportunity to come to Indiana and do it soon in the fall. That's awesome. Here's just the way it is. And I want you to look at how small those dots look in this big country. You see the states there? You see how far they are between? If we had 15 each year in each region, it wouldn't be enough to touch every person. But we're going to start this way. And I just picked random places where I've preached in the past and done seminars in the past and put them in there. But just think about the number of people in New England and the Northeast and how one seminar won't be enough. But just look at how we can cover our little part of the world. I'll be looking for congregations that want to host these kind of events. And then my favorite part. In the last few months, I have been sitting in old classrooms, in children's chairs, around little short tables, with mission committees, with preacher hiring committees, with um, church planting committees, sitting there and going through with them and saying, okay, I'm just a resource. Y'all come up with your ideas, and if there's something there, I'll weigh in on it. Or if you have a question, I'll try to help you with it. And the most amazing thing in the world happened to me the other day. We were sitting in a room with a group of elders, and we were talking about evangelism. And within the next few days, three elders brought somebody to Christ and baptized them. And it started in this little room talking about how to do it. And I shared with them something called the Roman Road to Salvation, a study that I teach here. And they said, we'll give it a shot, but you know, people aren't receptive. Well, after we cleared all the chairs, they were storing in the baptistry out, filled the baptistry up, got it cleaned up. We were able to baptize some people. But it wasn't me. It was their shepherds creating new sheep in their congregation. And that's of great value. We're helping congregations appoint new elders. We're helping congregations take their deacons out to a lake somewhere and sit down and say something that Richard Rogers used to teach here. If deacons don't deke and elders don't eld, preachers can't preach and the church will die. So we teach deacons how to deke, elders how to eld. I still don't know exactly what he's going for, but I like the concept of it as much as I understand it. Um, there was a congregation that's hiring a new preacher, and they said, come talk about our responsibility to this new preacher. As a preacher, that was the most flattering thing I think anybody's ever said. They wanted to know how to take care of a preacher and keep them. And any of you that serve in ministry, you want a congregation like that. That's amazing. But all those things, a lot of it right now deals with missions, and that's always fine. But another thing we've done is I told people I was going to do a seminar for raising funds and managing and administering nonprofits. That was a big mistake. <laughs> all these people from all these different groups want help with that. And um, I'm starting to look at these guys and go, let's see, you've got how many years experience? Forty? I've been doing this for seven or eight whole years. Uh, so we'll try to figure all that out. Also for missionaries raising funds, all those different things. We do it online with people. We also do it sitting in their church building with them. And I believe it's a value. We don't charge. We just want to help. Tools and resources. We're putting as much as we can in digital materials. We're going to put it on a website with a very good search engine. Find it. Use it, have it, it's just yours. Put videos and stuff up there, a secret helps. We're going to start having this thing called Salt Talks. Any of y'all know about TED Talks? Okay, I'm ripping that off so bad, you can't even believe it. We've got this big backdrop with the top of the salt shaker from the logo embedded in the back, and we're going to have 15-minute talks on specific topics taught by some of the greatest people in our brotherhood. And they're going to be sent out over the air. We're going to have a podcast. 
I don't even have this figured out yet. We've got this table with a microphone and so how are you doing today and all that kind of stuff. I don't even know how for sure how it works. We're putting together a podcast to give out that people can have pop up inside their phones and on their iPads. Um, we're doing as much as we can think to do. We're going to create a lot of print material and then digitize it where you can download it, have it on your phone or iPad or print it out for your Bible class and give it to our brotherhood. I'm excited about that. That feeds the area that I sort of enjoy playing in, but I think it's something we're going to need. We're going to have trained and equipped speakers, facilitators, and coaches, a bunch of them. We're also going to have church planting in a box, other things where we put together kits on how to raise the funds for it, how to vision it, how to start the steps towards going towards it, how to be the congregation that becomes the mother church, how to become the daughter church, all those different things. We're just going to seek to be responsive. Whatever the Lord's church needs, we're going to try to provide. So what's the cost? Ten billion dollars be the cost. Oh, no, that's the worth, maybe. We have been supported by the Lord's church for over 50 years. Church in Fort Worth, Texas, a church in Sunray, Texas, a church in Edmond, Oklahoma, have provided my family a salary while I've been here at Sunset. People are buying these solar players and sending them all over the world. Everything we ask for, people respond to and they give to us. Instead of creating a need to ask for more stuff, it has created us a need to give back in a big way. If you can afford to pay for me or someone else to come to your congregation, pay my expenses getting there, that's fine. If you can't, someone else will. But we don't want cost to be a detriment in getting the education your congregation needs. Now for some it's real easy. If you call and say, can you come to Clovis? I'll go to Portales first and then I'll cut up. But that's not so hard. But for a congregation in the middle of Montana, congregation in Maine, this could be a big challenge for them. We had a congregation in Virginia say, we want a campaign, we want you to come bring them. Well, we had several of our students pay their own way and we drove overnight, all through the night, got there to give it to them, drive all the way back just because they cared. It's not about what you have to pay. It's about what God can share with you. So what can you do? Pray about this. It's still in its formative stages. I pray that it becomes everything that my mind has dreamed of. But I pray knowing that it'll be more than that. Because Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 still works today. There is a power at work within us that can do more than we ever ask or imagine. When we did international schools... The Ukrainsky Bablinsky Institute was one of the first seven schools. Somebody would have told them way back then there will be more than 70 scattered over 42 or 3 nations. They'd have gone, ah, that's too much. But God's funny like that, isn't he? But pray that it grow and it develop and pray that these people will volunteer and that they will be, be there. I love, I presented this part of this in chapel. Immediately Ed came up and said, I want Ephesians 4. Give me that. I'll take that one. And I thought, well, I'll have to give it to him. <laughs> That's what he taught me, so uh, we'll do that. Um, share your ideas about what we can do. A vision becomes full when many visions come together, and that's what we need. I was teaching a class the other day on the ramifications of Jesus saying to his apostles, and you will do greater than I. Twelve was important. They used that number regardless of how many there were. Twelve was important. Um, that multiplicity of people and ideas is important. We'll all be faithful to God's word, but we all have our ideas. Talk about salt when you return to your congregation. Tell them when something comes up, hey, there's this loudmouth guy in Lubbock that would be happy to show up. You bring salt to the congregations you minister to. Some of you guys have been trained in things already. 
You focus on things that you've done and you know well, and you become the one who can go and teach that through salt in other congregations. Don't be just a receiver. Be a giver. If you've got the ability to help people have good song services and things, don't call up here and ask for that. Instead, ask, where can I go? Who can I help? What can I do? Because it's not about somebody from one place doing something. It's about people with expertise sharing what they have. And then, most importantly, just be salt and light in your community. Be that taste of God. Be that thing of value. Be that thing that gives health in your community. As we talked about yesterday, be that beam of light that connects with the other lights that come from the gospel of Christ in the Lord's church and shine with everything you've got. Because too many lights are going out. Too many lights are becoming dim. We've got to change this. And one way we're going to change this is through church leaders. I don't know if Abe Lincoln was right in anything, and I'm not talking about the president. I don't quote that president so much, but I do quote a teacher that taught me here named Abe Lincoln. He really believed that God was an active part of leadership being chosen in congregations. And when I was here at first, I said, oh, see, stop that. God's not there looking over somebody's shoulder going, check their name. That'd be a good one right here. All those things. But as I've grown and developed, I find that God works in a lot of ways through his church that I don't understand. God brings a lot of things to the surface that I don't understand. Somebody asked me the other day, can I do a 30-minute lesson on all the power of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I, I could talk for 30 minutes about it, but since I don't know all that, and since my mind's still trying to grasp it, I don't know why I would be one giving a talk like that. But he used to tell us that God fills congregations everywhere with people, and God salts them with gifts and abilities and talents. And if you have those gifts and abilities and talents, God calls you from Scripture to answer the need to lead in a congregation, to use the things he gave you through the Holy Spirit with a very specific purpose. And then it was the, the godly calling of Christians to look among them and find the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of people and bring them forward. And in that way, God's actively involved in the leadership selection process. I think he's right. And I think those great people that people saw the fruit of the Spirit in, that they loved that much, they trusted that much, and they lifted up in front of them, deserve every tool, every resource, and every help they can get to lead in their church. Don't you? We're going to try in our feeble way to offer what we can. And that's an offer I make to you. It may not be me. You probably don't need me. There are much, much better voices. Well, we will find people in different areas that come and help you with what your need is. And the funny thing about this group of courses is we don't know where it's going to end because we don't know every need they have. I've been sitting down trying to figure out every need and writing it down and developing curriculum for it. And as soon as I do that, while I'm writing the curriculum, I go, oh, here's another 15 needs people have. One of the ones I'm working on right now that I'm really excited about is being a biblically dynamic and active Christian woman in a congregation. And I'm working on curriculum, and I'm going to give it away to a woman like that. Because we need to develop great godly women that will impact their community. Amen. And we've always known that. But we always get so hung up on leadership issues and things that we forget that it's always been the greatest need we have in congregations. I, I look forward to what God does with all this. We really don't have any time, but I want you to think about this question. I want you to share with me. I have here... We worked really hard to get a SALT logo and things. 
I have some of my cards up here with information on it. It's the director of SALT. Think about it, and I needed one more job, so I thought we would just have this one. But what are some real things? And I mean that real things part. Don't come up with some esoterical, we need more faith. Okay, that's right. You need more faith. What are the real things you need to create faith? We need more hope. Well, you're right. What are the real things you need in your, create, in your congregation that will create that hope? What Bible text do you need? What character do you need studied? What topic do you need to have? And I promise you, we'll feel that need. It may take us a while. We'll meet that need. And I want you to be thinking about it. There's my information. I love all these people that just take pictures of things on screens and all that. It's much cheaper. Um, I'm easy to find here. But I want you to know that your congregation is what we're here for. The other day I was talking, they said, well, what is Sunset? And my first thing was, we are what's called a parachurch organization. And the guy said, well, what does that mean? And I said, we are here for the church. We are here as a servant of the church. We are here to assist the church. We don't make any, I hope we've never made any bones about it. That's what we're here for. And if you need that help, we hope you'll give us that opportunity because that would mean a lot. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we love the world. We love these flags that represent the nations of the world. But Father, in a very real way, this nation has been a leader and sending out missionaries, materials, so many things all across the country. When we moved to Ukraine, we thought we were bringing things there. We found out that you'd been there over and over and over again. And it's that way in all nations. And Father, we pray for the nations. But Father, at this time, we look especially at one. We pray for the United States of America. Every day, we are to pray for our leaders. Paul told Timothy that. And as Paul was discipling Timothy and teaching him what a godly person does, he at the same time was therefore teaching us those things. Father, I pray for President Trump. Sometimes he makes me so frustrated. Sometimes he gives me incredible hope. But every time... I'm reminded that he needs to know you better. Father, I pray that maybe Phil Robertson will be the one with the opportunity to do that, or maybe it will be someone else. But I pray that in whatever way possible he's impacted with the gospel of Christ can make that change. Because what an amazing thing that would be to see in the White House. Father, I pray for senators and congressmen and Supreme Court justices we pray for all the people that work in the offices and run back and forth, the people that prepare folks for meetings, the people that determine how money is spent, the people who deal with all those issues, not just in Washington, D.C., but also state by state across this country. Father, help them to value character. Help them to value God. Help them to think of those things when they go to vote on the things they have to deal with. Too many are focusing on what lobbyists and others say and do and promise. Help them to depend on what you say and do and promise. Father, we pray not just for leaders like that, but leaders in every arena. Whether it's a Boy Scout leader, a teacher in a classroom, a, a school board member, whatever it is. We pray that you help them to make a stand for God today to make you a priority today, and then do it for the rest of time. We're thankful for the leaders in our military and all those who follow so well. Father, we have not been as active as we should be in ministering to them. For that, we repent and we'll change. 
It's not enough to put them on bulletin boards and say prayers from time to time. We've got to actively go and seek their spiritual benefit as well. And I pray that you'll help us as we do that. Father, I pray that you will inspire us in our communities to be active. I pray that everywhere there is a church of Christ in a community, the people of that community go, that's the place where they'll come help us. That's the place where you go for answers. That's a living place here in our community that we need. Father, I pray that you'll be with every church leader. Some are in over their heads. Well, we need to give them something to stand on. Some are frustrated and upset about what happens. They had expectations that aren't being met. We pray that we become their counsel and we whisper in their ear and we bring calm to their heart. We pray for preachers filling pulpits. May they speak words of truth. May they speak them in a positive, caring way that builds up the hearts of all who listen. We pray for those who serve as youth ministers or deaf ministers or education ministers. Be with them and help them to realize that they're your hands in communities. They're your mouth. They're your eyes. Help them to minister with clean hearts, watching out for their own purity in doctrine and in life as they serve others. Father, we pray for moms and dads. Pray that they'll lead well inside their households. Some of us were given the benefit of, of great Christian homes, but so many today don't know that benefit. We pray for our children's homes and other agencies that help with children who do not have the homes they needed. We pray for those who are having to raise their grandchildren, for single moms, for people that are adopting children. We pray for all of them and the way they change the community around us. We pray for those who make soup and give to poor people. We're grateful for those who throw blankets out of the back of trucks for those who are sleeping on the street. We're thankful for everyone who's trying to do what they can to make this world better. And Father, we pray that you teaching will always be a part of that because being well-fed and warm in this world but not going to heaven is not a gift. Help us to always follow up with godly teaching. Father, we're thankful for those here today, and may we be a catalyst for change in our world, catalyst for change in our country, and may we spread the fire of evangelism, missions, hope, and wellness everywhere we go. Father, we pray that you will help assemble the team, that you'll lead the team, that will go and carry your message to congregations across our brotherhood. And Father, may you help it always to be right and always to be what's needed and always to be what's practical and able to be applied. Be with us, Father, and help us as we go through this workshop. Help us as we go through our ministry. Help us as we go through our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's some of my cards up here. You can have one. They're really impressive with this logo on them. Um, the point of these cards is to give them all away, so feel free to take them. And uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate it very much.